Kate Murray. I work at the Technology Policy Directorate at the Library of Congress. Um, a couple things to know about me is that I run the FAGI Audiovisual Working Group, and I'm one of the co-authors of the uh, Sustainability for Digital Formats website, which some of you may be familiar with. I'm both an author and a consumer of standards, documentation, and specifications. Uh, one clarification is I, I do not work at Culpepper, which is the National Audiovisual Conservation Center. Um, I work closely with them, so I'm very much on the policy, research, and development side, and I'm not an implementer, which will probably explain some of the issues with ASO7. Um, I'm very excited to be at this conference today to talk a little bit about ASO7, but also really to learn about <coughs> FFB1 and Matroska's characteristics in the standardization process. Uh, I think both of our projects are working towards similar goals of standardized wrappers and codecs for improved format sustainability and interoperability, but we've just taken different approaches. Uh, a real turning point for me was last year at the YASA conference in Paris. Everyone was talking about FFV1, and I remember being at the reception uh, at the Bibliothèque Nationale and even talking with Hermann and thinking to myself, everyone's talking about FFV1, uh, and there wasn't a lot of chat of, at all about um, ASO7 uh, or MXF, and I thought to myself, we really need to reach out more to this community to find out really what's happening here, um, and also to work more on our communication and um, uh, our, our, just our engagement in the community um, at large, and I'll talk a little bit about that later. So at this conference, I'm wearing several hats. Um, I am the owner, the project owner of um, ASO7, now that my colleague Carl Fleischauer has retired. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll talk uh, just a little bit of a spoiler alert. Uh, we don't believe that MXF is the answer to every problem. It's, it's one answer, but there are lots of other um, options available. I'm also doing a reconnaissance for the YASA TC06 publication, so I'm on the technical committee of YASA, and uh, I actually have a sheet of questions with me to find out about FFB1 and Matroska, because as part of that publication, we're building a codec uh, and wrapper comparison chart, which I think to see Tobias had done, um, and it's uh, and so we need to fill in um, our knowledge a little bit about that. And just on a personal level, I'm very interested to build relationships and increase our dialogue with this community. Uh, a very brief overview of what I'll talk about today. I'll give a quick uh, 10,000 foot view of what FAGI is. Uh, I'll bring folks up to speed on OKS7. We reached a milestone last week, um, and I'll talk about some of our significant and perhaps unique features, but I'm thinking they may not be so unique after all. I've heard a lot of talk about them already this morning. Uh, I'll talk about our standardization process through AMLA, which is a vendor-neutral trade organization. And finally, uh, what's next, and a little bit about what I, we, I wish we had done differently in the standardization process. So, uh, FAGI is uh, a terrible acronym for a great group of people who do good work. It stands for the U.S. Federal Agency's Digitization Guidelines Initiative. Uh, we have 20 institutional members, soon to be 21. Uh, they're all U.S. federal agencies. It includes the Library of Congress, the U.S. National Archives, the Smithsonian, the National Library of Medicine, but also scientific organizations such as NOAA, which is the National Atmos Oceanic and Atmospheric Association, and NASA, which is our space agency. We have two working groups. One should focus on still images, and many of you are likely familiar with the publication, the technical guidelines of digitizing cultural heritage materials. That really only covers still images. I mean, you don't say that in their title, but that really only covers still images. And then there's the audiovisual working group with ILE, and we look at audio, video, and motion picture film. We've done a couple of big projects that you may be familiar with. Uh, one of them we did with um, ADPS, and that's where I met Dave, uh, when we worked on BWF Meta Edit and the embedded guidelines for um, uh, metadata in uh, broadcast wave files. We did a format comparison for reformatted video. We did a recent statement of work for digitizing motion picture film. Uh, we're looking currently at evaluating uh, ABC testing for audio, and we have a brand new project uh, to develop guidelines and tools for embedded metadata into DPS. And I think we're going to hear about DPS um, after this. I'm curious about that. And we've done lots of other stuff. So FAGI is led by the Library of Congress, but we're a very collaborative group. Um, FAGI, especially the library, is the proud sponsor of the MXF application specification, lovingly known as AS07. AS stands for application specification in the formal, former AMWA naming convention, and AS07 was just the next number in line. And you'll notice I said former naming convention, and I'll talk about that in a sec. 
Uh, at various times, our project team has included representatives from the Library of Congress, the U.S. National Archives, EVS, Audiovisual Preservation Solutions, the Canadian Broadcasting Company, George Blood Audio Video, and Medicine. So one of the first things you should know about AIP 7 is that it's 114 pages long, but actually I'm feeling pretty good now that I heard the was 300 pages long, so I don't feel bad about that. Um, AIP 7 includes many prose sections with a lot of background information that we feel is uh, helpful for folks in the cultural heritage community. My standard joke here is I read the RFCs or the Cindy specs that so you don't have to, right? You can just read the Cliff Notes version in AIP 7. But it turns out that a lot of folks, especially systems implementers, don't want to read 114 pages. Um, and so we're going to do something about that, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, another thing, I've been working on AS07 longer than I have worked at the Library of Congress. I've been working on this for seven years, and I've only been at the library for three. So it's a really big project in every sense of the word. We started in 2009. Between 2010 to 2015, we published a series of drafts and background reports, and just last week, we achieved uh, the official AMWA proposed specification status, which sounds made up, but it's a thing and it's a big deal for us. So uh, a quick clarification, uh, AS07 is not a standard, right? MXF is a standard, right? That's published through SIMPD, through ST377-1, but an AS is uh, a profile that, uh, or a statement from the community that pins down some preferred options uh, the constraints in an application specification support greater interoperability, increase the comfort level for users, and increase vendor competition, and we hope uh, lead to more adoption and thus better format sustainability. So these are exactly the same goals as the Seller project, um, but just taking a different um, track towards it. So MXF, as I said, is not the universal answer. Certainly, national libraries and archives that do hold broadcast collections, and that's where you're going to find stuff like local time codes, audio tracks, local audio tracks, captions, time text, subtitles, segmented essences, and the need for embedded associated components like photos of the box cover or augmented metadata. If your archive has simpler forms of content, MXF may not be the right choice for you. Not all FADGI members, I should say, plan to implement uh, AS07. Certainly the National Archives probably will not. They do uncompressed in ADI because their collections don't warrant it. Um, the library likely will uh, implement AS07. So if you have less complex collections, a simpler video format may suit your needs. Um, but if you're curious, I, I should say, if NXS, NXF is for you or not, uh, my colleague Carl Fleischauer wrote a great paper called uh, The User Needs and MFX. MXF options, and that's available on the FADGI site, and the link is right there. So here's our usual summary of all the good things about AS07, and I'll go through these at a very high level. My goal really at this conference is to better understand how and if Matroska can do these things, and what are the features of Matroska that AS07 does not address. Um, so uh, we've heard some chat this, today about time codes, so multiple time codes uh, may be present on purpose or by accident. But all time code can provide forensic help for future resources. Um, users of the master time code file that you would create when you're reformatting would benefit from the presence of a new high integrity and continuous time code. We call for a master time code in ASX7 <coughs> files, again, which is continuous and high integrity. We also call for the retention of what we call, or what EVU calls, historical source time codes. That's legacy time codes. And we, we require and provide the mechanism to tag these multiple time codes in a file. And we've created a series of new subdescriptor tags to augment and facilitate this. Um, we've actually uh, uh, sent that work off to SIMPTI, and they are incorporating that in their um, update of this time code and NXF uh, specification. So here is an image of, or uh, uh, yeah, an image of the structure of an NXF file with some multiple time codes in the essence <laughs> container there at the bottom. Um, which is, we have continuous master and discontinuous legacy, and also in the tracks of the packages at the top. And our new subdescriptors are sketched out there in the red boxes, which you probably can't see. But uh, to, in, to create these subdescriptors, we assembled uh, elements from a number of different SIMPI standards, as well as created the new structures to label, for example, things like the essence track ID, which would label something as a master time code, and the channel ID, and a general description element. Uh, so next we see the information to carry, we see the need to carry information beyond basic picture and sound. NXF files are made up of partitions, and one is called the generic stream partition, or the GSP. 
And that can provide, uh, it can carry things like text-based data, which would be something like XML, or binary data, like still images in a stream. Well, maybe you can kind of read that. Okay, so I, I won't read this uh, over, but this is a quick glance to give you a sense of what we think some archives would want to embed. Uh, and how ASC7 would classify and carry the information and the metadata about this information in, in various files. Um, and so if we talk about metadata, uh, MXF has a good place for parametric metadata in the picture and sound essence descriptors, and those are described in CT 377.1, Appendix F2. Um, you can tell I spent a lot of time with 377.1, right, when I can whip off the appendix number, um, as well as generic data descriptors. Um, for ASC7, we saw the need for embedding additional technical metadata, stuff like process metadata, information about the source item, and quality review, outcomes, and preservation metadata. So there are different schools of thought about embedding richer descriptive metadata. SIMPI specifies uh, a structure that's called DMS1, Descriptive <coughs> Metadata Scheme 1, and that's um, specified in SIMPI uh, 330M. Uh, and we give the option to use that, but uh, reflecting other FAGI work that we've done, uh, FAGI embedded metadata projects that we've done, we require only skeletal information, and that's stuff like identifier, who owns this, uh, maybe a little bit of a version of coding history, um, and we offer the generic screen partition as a place to park more descriptive metadata if you want to. We've heard uh, quite a bit this morning about captions. Um, so captions and subtitles are a big deal in broadcast collections. U.S. broadcast standards have required various flavors of binary coded data, or binary coded closed captioning rather. In Europe, you have EBU STL binary subtitle system. Uh, now on both sides of the Atlantic, we want to move more towards XML-based timed text, um, AS7. Echoes uh, CTRP 2057 that recommends carrying time text in generic stream partitions. Uh, and this is just a summary of how that kind of data is carried and described in ASO7. And um, this is from one of our informative sections. And indeed, they're informative, right? It's a, it's a nice summary there. Uh, we heard a little earlier about uh, how Matroska might handle and tag audio tracks. I think Tobias, you were mentioning that, and I'm very curious about this. Um, because the ASF7's implementation of Synthes metadata scheme includes the requirements and options for listing and allocating soundtracks and tagging the languages. And we have quite a complex structure of that, uh, and it's very helpful for uh, multiple audio tracks. So I'd be curious to um, hear more about how Matroska handles that. Content integrity, you know, Dave first introduced me to what we call intra-frame content integrity. Um, and so for frame level, intra-file, pardon me, not intra-frame, intra-file. So um, for frame level fixity data, we adapted a hybrid approach that combines the aspects of the BBC and Simply Digital Cinema uh, standardized through 429.6. So in summary, it's a little confusing. Uh, we borrow the structure for the fixity data from the BBC Archive and Preservation format, and that's specified in the BBC white paper 233, that's available online. And that creates the fixity value for every V, or value data unit, in the KLV triplet. Um, and uh, that represents frame wrap essences, and we expect most material that's going to um, be held in AS7 files to be frame wrapped. Um, the exception is interlaced JP2000. And that's wrapped as, separate, as a separate KLV triplet. So the fixed V value is calculated for the compactness values of the two, two Vs in the pair of the KLV triplet. Um, we have a change from the BBC approach in that we advocate uh, the Castagnoli CRC 32C um, instead of the PNG CRC 32C, because 32 rather, because we thought it would be easier to calculate. Uh, for the metadata about the fixed V object, we borrow the DMS structure from SIMT 4296. Again, with a small change, um, we don't expect much material uh, that's going to be carried in an AS7 file to be encrypted because the uh, gist of AS7 files is for archiving and preservation, and uh, encryption would uh, that is not it's not something you want to support for archiving and preservation. So, to allow decoders to differentiate between AS7 use of system items and ST429 use, which includes the option for encrypted triplets. AS07 defines an optional item, a new optional item called mic carriage in the cryptographic context set, which in which a system item value uh, declares AS07 uses, and if there's no value, it means that there's encrypted triplets. Uh, 
So basically we're saying uh, this is for AS7, so you should not look for encryption here. So encodings. Um, so AS7 is really about the wrapper, not about encodings per se. Our first profiles, uh, Definitions focus on common essences for reformatted video, specifically uncompressed, which the U.S. National Archives uses, and JPEG 2000 lossless, which the Library of Congress uses, but other profiles might follow. At this time, I don't believe that there's a SMPTP mapping of FFV1 to MXF, um, but if it was mapped, then it would certainly, we could certainly think about creating a profile for FFV1 and ASF. Um, so I'm going to anticipate a question. Um, uh, I often hear like if there's no sample files, the specification is kind of useless. There are sample files. They really do exist and they're a hair breadth away from release. They were created by EBS. Um, we have a set of uh, files ranging from gold to lead, four for uncompressed and four for JPEG 2000, uh, but they're not comprehensive. One thing that the files lack is content integrity data. We just didn't have the funding in this round to include that, but we will to next time. Um, the industry interest in ASR7 and the, specifically the sample files, um, we've heard queries from CubeTech and Telestream and some others, and once we get release, those files cleared for release, which hopefully I'm thinking end of summer, um, we'll likely make them available for download for our fashion play. Um, so let's talk about the standardization process. So um, why did we choose AMWA for defining the ASR7 spec? There's certainly other options like SIMPT, um, and FFP1 and Matroska has chosen IETF. Um, so AMWA, if I have not defined that already, is the Advanced Media Workflow Association, and it's a broadcast industry group. And we chose them because they already published a variety of standards on other NXF application specifications. When we were asking around, like 2009, 2010, AMWA was very active in the field and had the ear of both the broadcast industry and other institutions of similar size, scope, and complexity, especially the BBC. Uh, I'll be honest and say that uh, the Library of Congress is a little bit of an outlier in this group, but we were looking for a vendor neutral space in which we could develop and publish a standard. FAGI, uh, we were not a standard organization. We published guidelines and best practices, but we were looking for something more formally defined than what we had done before and we needed a wider range of participants than just the best of the agencies. So some of the benefits about working with AMLA is that it's vendor neutral, and we needed a safe space as, a, as a, a government agency to interact with commercial vendors and get feedback and avoid conflicts of interest. Um, that's a very challenging um, space to be in as a federal agency, uh, what you can talk to vendors about and how you can talk to them without giving anyone um, uh, uh, sort of advanced knowledge or um, and, uh, a chance of getting a contract more than anyone else. We, we would want to avoid that for sure. Um, uh, AMWA is also international, although FAGI members, of course, are U.S. federal agencies, our collections go beyond our national borders. Um, part of the deal was that uh, the standard uh, has open accessibility, be open access. Uh, products of U.S. government agencies can hold no copyright, and people shouldn't have to pay for them. You already paid once for your taxes. You shouldn't have to pay for this again. Um, there's some debate, I would say, um, if, if AMWA standards always held a Creative Commons license. They do now, though, right? So we helped them write that, and AS07 uh, is help proudly uh, holds the CC by SA4 license, and now so will all other AMWA ASs going forward. Uh, the downside of this is that I've mentioned SIMPTI many times in this talk. We strongly rely on specifications that are behind paywalls. Um, that's just the nature of the broadcast industry that uh, the Library of Congress is heavily invested in, uh, and we recognize that's an issue. We do try to cover a lot of what's in those four key specs in our background sections. Uh, it's not a perfect answer, but we are trying to make an effort to bridge that gap. So all has not gone as smoothly as one would like this process to go, I would say. Um, more than halfway through, uh, our project, AMWAT, changed its expected deliverables from a prose-based document to machine-readable work products, and that's a great goal. It saves uh, systems implementers from reading 114 pages of text to get to what they really want, but it wasn't what we signed up for when we started the process. Our document is by far the largest AMWAT, la largest and most complex uh, AMWAT standard, um, and, but we certainly had a lot to lose, the most to lose, by moving to rules-based specifications and publishing using GitHub, 
Uh, we are working uh, in our next fiscal year. There will be an X XML version of our rule set. Um, but uh, meanwhile, our prose based uh, document still stands. The other big issue was that EMWA underwent a radical change in its internal process. It changed how new proposals for work are initiated, what is required to elevate a document from one level to another, and how types of specifications are assigned. In short, AMWA wanted to move towards the IETF, RFC, publication process. And again, this is great, but maybe not in the middle of our project. Um, the Library of Congress, especially Carl Fleischauer, took a very active role in moving AMWA into this space. And in the end, both AMWA and ASU7 uh, came out successfully. I guess another one of our issues, uh, we've heard about that and something similar in Tessa's report, it's really hard to move these things along quickly. It's hard to get feedback from vendors. AMWA is a small organization, folks are busy. The Library of Congress is certainly not as nimble as one might like it to be. Um, things take a long time. We've been doing this since 2009. We're cautious by nature in our outputs, and maybe we're too cautious. We want perfection before we show people what we're doing, but I think that expectation is now changing a little bit. Uh, so what do we have to do? Uh, I've mentioned that we've met our milestone, which is great, um, but what do we do next? So most immediately, uh, we need to get our samples out there and get feedback from them. Vendors want to see what it would take to develop an ASO 7 compliant tool. Uh, we want community feedback on our features, what's overkill and what's missing in ASO 7. We need to develop our machine readable tool sets, that's on the calendar for fiscal year 2017. We need to do a better job of communication, which I think is something that this group does really well. And we want to possibly develop more profiles beyond uncompressed NJK2000. So if I had it to do all over again, what would I do differently? Um, I would certainly constrain the scope. Just because the Library of Congress has very diverse collections, you know, we have the original Wheels of Gone with the Wind, but we also have the Star Wars Christmas special. Um, it doesn't mean that the specification has to do every possible variation. It's okay to say no or not right now. Uh, we've been hard at work at this for seven years, but most of people don't see our duck's feet moving furiously under the cold, uh, under the calm water. Um, maybe we should have released our work uh, more iteratively, so uh, even if it wasn't perfect, so people could see more progress. Um, you know, perfect is the enemy of the good. We certainly pride ourselves on high quality products, but maybe we paid a price for that and the time it takes to do that with the lower profile and what I experienced last year at Yafa. There's a lot of movement in this field. And we should try to engage more with what others are doing and allow others to peek more into what we're doing. And I believe that that's really what this conference is about. It's about sharing our knowledge to advance everyone forward. So thank you very much.
We are light on purpose on um, descriptive embedded metadata because we believe that that should, it's easier to update that stuff when it's outside of the file. Uh, you mentioned uh, converting the narrative of ASO7 into a machine readable XML mm -hmm. document to help facilitate uh, testing. Mm -hmm. um, is for, to to make that expression in XML, is there a particular like policy driven or like cause effect like XML standard that can support that or is the expression of XML itself to hold those policies something that also has to be uh, I would say it's in the process of being created, so uh, AS11 has done a lot of work on that, uh, and we will follow their lead. AMA has not given us a specification for it yet, but we're working towards it. We'll, we'll have to do whatever they assign us to do. But uh, we would have a, a loud voice in that conversation. But we haven't started creating yet. But. Yes? There are two questions. One I'm careful, so I'm gonna do the, the nice one first. The one could be tricky. You should do the bad one first. Come on, yeah. right, go ahead. Um, okay, the, the thing is that um, it's a very good thing that you do this. From what I've seen from ASO7 so far, it's definitely like, needed for things to work. Now, when I spoke with certain vendors and also with developers, they're actually is good money to make from stuff that's not working. So for the time being, there are some companies that really, really, really have a good time for the business with them except not being interoperable. Um, how's the feedback from vendors? What is their, their incentive to make it work? Well, I would say, uh, we've had some feedback from vendors. We hope to get more after the distribution of the sample file so they can see more. There's something tangible there for them to evaluate what is it worth their while to invest in making tools that would be ASO 7 compliant or not. So it's a little hard for me to answer that. We certainly have had interest. Um, and the Library of Congress will likely be an adopter. And so there will be sort of a built-in audience there already. but. I think your question is a fair one. <coughs> How, uh, you know, interoperability is certainly an issue, and that's one of the reasons why we undertook this project to increase our interoperability. We thought if we have this standard, people can build to the standard. Uh, and so time will tell. I, I guess that's all I have to say, time will tell. We haven't had any, uh, MetaBlue has built some tools that are ASO7 compliant. Uh, MetaBlue is one of our contractors that has helped us, um, uh, is a paid contractor that has helped us uh, write the specification, and they have built some tools, but there's no audience for those tools yet because there's no adoption yet because the publication was just finalized last week. But, but there is adoption of MSF, so I guess probably anybody <coughs> who has MSF might have interest in having an archiving profile, I guess, at ASO7. That's true. Yeah. So from, from the memory institution position, it's completely clear that it makes perfect sense. And now, as you say, okay, time will tell. Um, Thanks for this. The second one was you said um, you added CRCs, BBC style, and then you said you do not have any intended checks for content. And that was confusing for me because it's very complicated. No, okay, so we had frame level fixity checks? Yeah. Uh, we, we changed just the algorithm, right? So we didn't do, uh, we do Castagnoli CRC 32, uh, and I think the BBC that we adapted our structure from used PNG, so that, okay. that's what that change was. And we chose the Cassidy one because we thought it would be easier for folks to calculate that rather than the PNG. We, and I did not say, I don't think necessarily, that uh, ASU7 is not concerned with uh, file-based fixing checks. We're, we're, at, we're at frame or KLB's uh, uh, level checks. So, because if it's a whole file, we believe that that's the ingest, uh, that's a repository action, not yes. a, a file for it, not yes. an action for ASU7. Makes perfect sense. But in one slide, you said you don't, you do not have an integrity for the content. That was a sample. Of we do have. I I must have misspoke, or my slide was wrong. So we do have fixity checks. I mean, if, if you're talking content, oh, mm -hmm. and maybe maybe it was a, a. Should we go back to that slide? Because now I'm wondering yeah, what's going on. Oh, the sample 
files, yes, thank you. So in our sample files that will be released, those sample files do not contain oh. uh, integrity uh, information just because we did not have the funding to put that. That in was it. I wasn't, but you just said you did it, but then you said it didn't. But I uh, misunderstood that. Wasn't oh. misunderstood enough. I, I'm sure I wasn't clear, but but yeah, that's actually that. Great. Perfect. Okay. Thank you very much. Well, yeah. All right. Thank you so much. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Uh, please, uh, could you summarize? Uh, It's super complex. <laughs> a lot. I guess if you spell it that, it's a little more. It, it, it's a very complex format. And we recognize, certainly, that many institutions wouldn't want to take it on. And they don't need to. The US National Archives is a prime example. right? They uh, have huge holdings, but a lot of their holdings is just sort of talking heads. It doesn't have time code in it. There's no multiple audio tracks. There's no language issues. They don't need MXF. The Library of Congress, because we are connected partially because we are connected to the US Copyright Office, and so we are heavily tied to broadcast industry stuff, so anything from Hollywood that's gonna be copyrighted is gonna to come to the Library of Congress. So we have to deal with all of that complex material, which is why we need a format that can contain all of that. And you had asked a question earlier about, well, maybe some of this data should be held elsewhere, right? And like, why do you do that? And MXF is an interesting option, is an interesting combination of those things, because. In one case, we want to be able to hold everything in one file, and that includes like, so you have the picture and the sound essence data, you have your time code, but then you also might have the script, right? You might have, a, uh, you might have pictures of the files, of, uh, a picture of the cover of the box. You could have the trailers. You could have all of that in one file. Yes? Uh, you explained that M7 is actually a profile that covers a whole set of specifications. Most of the mark seventy specifications. Uh, is there anywhere a place where you where you have a comprehensive overview on what specifications are involved and what are the conditions for people that write code that implements an ASO seven file? Sure. So in in ASO seven itself, we have a reference list right that will tell you all of the. Uh, um, specifications that we rest reference from elsewhere, and that includes the BBC white papers, a lot of SIMS documentation, and other stuff. Um, and then we try to cover, because that information is behind paywall from SIMTI, we can't like wholesale copy and paste it, but we try to cover a lot of it in our informative sections. And if, do you have any plans to communicate to our developers on what are the conditions for writing code that implement this software? Because sometimes it might be very complicated to find out what what conditions actually apply when you write your piece of software? Yeah, so uh, I think a lot of that will be covered in our rule set that we'll publish, the XML rule set. Um, so as much as possible, I think it will be covered there. If, if you need more information, you can certainly call us. So uh, EBS, who is our subcontractor through Audiovisual Preservation Solutions, who built our sample files. Um, so they made, um, you know, we have a rule set that they developed um, and, and that informed um, the software that they had to uh, alter in order to make our ASO 7 files. Thank you. Sure. Now I think we're done. Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate it.